All right, so I've got a couple things. <laughs> I'm gonna preach from the gospel of Jeb Blunt. <laughs> Virtual selling, okay. <laughs> I hope that's not sacrilegious. <laughs> this is um, this book really rocks. I mean, I love I love this book. So I was reading the section on telephone prospecting. Okay, now the way Jeff Blood talks about telephones prospecting, this is like cold prospecting, meaning these people aren't calling on a lead. These people are cold prospecting, like how I used to do in the in the uh, recruiting business. Oh, cold prospect. So this is one level before, like when we get a lead, we got a lead of someone who responds to something, whether it's an internet ad, whether it's talking to a telemarketer, um, a Facebook ad, a direct mail piece that they filled out and sent in, they're responding to something. So we've kind of advanced ourselves in the client's mind, talking to someone that showed some level of interest in life insurance, okay? He talks about tele cold telephone prospecting, um, which is, you know, one level below, but it's still relevant, you know, um, and so I'm going to pull some things out here. You know, this is sort of the add-on to um, pick up the damn phone, right? The, the thing I did on pick up the damn phone, this is um, sort of that extension, kind of the next level, and the whole notion of... Um, Okay, so let me uh, get to the part that I want to talk about. Okay, so this is this is the other stuff on pick up the damn phone. So nobody answers a phone that doesn't ring. Okay, so let's let's talk about the context of us calling people, and that's what we do. Like we take it for granted, and I think a lot of call reluctance comes out of the the simple fact that you are um, uncomfortable, right? You're uncomfortable calling people up. And here, and here's why. He says, um, um, he talks about people, he talks about uh, we don't like to interrupt people. Like we don't want to be interrupted. Like I'm talking, I get a phone call, I don't want to be interrupted because I'm doing this call. You know, and, and what really bothers me <laughs> is that people who should know that I'm doing a webinar and actually should be on the webinar, they're calling me on the phone. I'm going, huh, they should be on the TWC. I'm on the TWC. They're calling me when I'm on the TWC. It's like, huh, I guess they're not attending the TWC. So I kind of look at them different. You know, like I said, if I'm going to invest my money, my lead money into somebody, you know, I got to know that they're plugging in, they're doing all the things I, I think that someone should do to be successful. Why would I want to invest my lead money in someone who doesn't, right? So it's kind of funny, but the whole idea of being interrupted. Telephone calls are interruptions, right? Aren't they? Like you pick up your phone, you're wondering who it is, they kind of interrupted your day, you're doing something, all of a sudden the phone rings and you're wondering, is this important or not? Well, I don't know until I pick up the phone, right? And I think part of that call reluctance comes from you interrupting someone else's day, you know, mentally, because you don't like to be interrupted. He goes, well, then here's the thing. He talks about salespeople. Like, I know, man, I know y'all heard it. No one ever picks up their phone. Man, how can your business work? Because no one answers their phone. It's that premise in your mind that no one answers the phone. <laughs> And what's hilarious about that is, do you know statistically more people are answering their phone now? Here's the other reason why people answer their phone is because their phones are with them. You know, back in the day, some of you old people like me, when we didn't carry our phones with us, we'd have to go to a pay phone, right? Or we'd have to be home or in the office to receive a call, right? But with mobile phones, you know, all the young people are going, when did that ever happen? <laughs> Go to the Smithsonian, you see a little box with a little ha handset on there, and there's these little dialer things on there. And God forbid you try to dial zero because you got to go all the way around. And if your finger slips, 
you mess the number up, you got to hang up and redial. So don't let your finger slip. <laughs> Some of y'all remember dialing with your pencil? <laughs> anyway, I know there's only a few of us that remember that. But um, now pe their phone, people are with their phones, you know. Our attention spans are so short anymore. People answer their phones just to be interrupted sometimes. But whining that no one ever answers their phone is, is just a, you're whining because people do. People pick up their phones, right? Um, check this out. Statistics don't lie. He says, we see between a 15% and 80% contact rate prospecting by phone depending on the industry product and, and role level of the contact. On our lead program, the direct mail lead program, we used to track contact, contact rate, dialing it three times in a row, and we're seeing anywhere from 14, 14 to 16% contact rate when you dial three times in a row, okay? I mean, you dial 100 dials, you're gonna get hold of 14 people out of 100. So it's just numbers, right? He says here, phones are anchored to people now, not their desks. People, you may not think, you may think that um, people aren't gonna pick up the phone because they're getting bombarded with phone calls. You know, we're, we're getting spam calls. You're probably getting spam calls, but you know what? relative to the rest of your day, you're not getting called every minute of the day. In fact, I would do a, you know, how do you break down if I did, because that means I got more agents calling me needing help. Think about it, the phone did not work. Why are there so many teleprospecting companies springing up all over the globe and thriving? And that is true. So it's just an excuse um, anyway. So, uh, okay. So this is the, some of the stuff he talks about on the phone. Again, when you pick up a phone and call a prospect and they're not expecting your call, you are an interruption to them, right? Um, it says here, if you want the peace of mind of a full pipeline, if you want sustained success in your sales career, if you want to maximize your income, then you have to interrupt prospects. Now remember, he's, call, he's talking about an interruption on cold prospecting, right? Because he's talking about virtual selling. So the easiest way to virtual sell is to do cold prospecting on the phone and then set up a face-to-face -face meeting on the internet to do a virtual sale on a video conference call. He talks about blending. So the initial phone call is doing, um, is filtering the person in or out, whether or not this is a qualified prospect. And then the second meeting is a virtual sale, meeting them face-to-face -face on the internet, okay? You know, we, we call people and we sell them on the phone if we can. If we need to do a video call, we'll do a video call. If we need to do a second appointment on the phone, we'll do that too, okay? But, so he's coming in from that perspective, but the, the principles still apply. If you want the peace of mind of a full pipeline, it's purely a product of being on the phone. We talk about this being the, the wealth position and this being the broke position. Wealth position, broke position. If you're not in wealth position, then you're in broke position. Does that make sense? I mean, I mean this, this may seem so fundamental, but if I don't cover the fundamentals, then you know the person who doesn't understand fundamentals of selling in our industry, in our business, will never get it. And I'm talking about one of the most important things here right now. In fact, the last few phone calls we've done, like coaching calls have been on handling phone objections and being on the phone and doing the phone work in order to make this thing. It's really, it really should be a given that you have to be on the phone to make money with us, but I, I have to cover it because I don't think that enough dialing is going on out there, right? The number one reason for failure in this in sales is an empty pipeline. And the number one reason salespeople have an empty pipeline is that they fail to pick up the phone. Amen, brother. Can I hear an amen from the 
from the people out there. <laughs> Amen. Right. Amen. That's right. Thank you very much for that one. As a salesperson, you have, you have a choice to make. Interrupt or start a new career at your local coffee shop making minimum wage. I love when he says stuff like that. It's like put up or shut up. If you're gonna complain about having to pick up the phone in this business, well then why don't you just like quit this and go complain being a barista at, at Starbucks. Actually, they actually make better than minimum wage. My daughter worked there. She was making like 15 bucks an hour um, at Starbucks in New York. That was like their, <laughs> that's what she was making out there, man. Anyway. Okay, so we kind of talked some of the techniques of doing that, but let me get to kind of the part on getting past telephone prospect, prospecting objections. So part of the fear also is you, you're interrupting somebody and then you're afraid of what they're gonna say back as an objection. You know, that's a natural thing, right? It's a natural thing to be afraid of, you know, because as you all know, when you first start making dials with us, you know, when you got your first objection, and even though we have the objections all spelled out in a script, right, and because you didn't practice it, you don't know what to say. You get flush, you know, you get that hot feeling under the collar, your face gets flush, the mind goes blank, a wave of embarrassment rolls over you as your weak attempt to overcome the objection is rebuffed and the prospect hangs up. And with this, your motivation for telephone prospecting evaporates. So any ounce of courage you had goes up in an instant when you don't know what to say. <laughs> it's so hilarious. And what's funny about this is I personally can relate, right? It happened to me and it's happened to all of you. I know it has. You know, even if you've, it doesn't happen to you now. It happened to you when you first got into sales, right? Prospecting is erupt, interrupting. You don't enjoy being interrupted. So here's the thing that, man, the, you know, okay, so I was a den leader for my son's den in, in Cub Scouts, and I was a very involved parent. My first son went through Cub Scouts. And, uh, you know, the, the whole motto of be prepared, right? In scouting, you got to be prepared. So you're in preparation with all your merit badges and all the things you do. Bottom line is, you know, you're a good citizen, you know, um, and and you're prepared. You're prepared to react in adverse situations that you may encounter. Right. I, I love that whole notion. Um, what most people do is they think when they get involved with us is that every objection is a unique and separate thing that happens every time. So whenever you get an objection, it's not like the last one, it's a new one because it's a new person you're calling. So you think like there's an infinite number of objections you're gonna run into. When in all actuality, there's only about three or four, honestly, in our industry that you're gonna run up against. Okay, there's only a very, there's only a very, few, very few. He says here, um, usually three to five objections make up 80% or more of the prospecting objections you'll face. That's so true. With us, it's about three to five that you're gonna get 80% of. Now on occasion, you're gonna call me and tell me some wild, crazy objection. And it's like, God, how did you get that? <laughs> I've never gotten that before. And it's like, it doesn't even help me to even answer that one because you'll probably never get that one again right? But here in the book, he lists these out. Um, we're happy or all set. We're all set. We're happy. I'm not interested. Gee, <laughs> don't have the budget. In other words, I can't afford it, right? Um, we're under contract. I'm not the right person. I need to speak to someone else before blah, blah, blah. I'm too busy. Just send information overwhelmed. I got too many things going on right now. I just talked to someone about that yesterday. And um, we used your company before and it didn't work out. We do this in house. We don't work with outside vendors. One of your reps called me last week and I already said no. We tried this product 
or service before and it didn't work out, just looking, checking you out. And he says, this is more inbound calling. Um, so he says here something that um, we've actually done for you, but, but, you know, he's talking in perspective of a new salesperson is make a list of your common objections that you've been running into you personally. And, and it's going to come down to like the frequency. So you go through a dial session, write down your objections you're getting, and then tick off the ones that you're getting multiple object objections on. And over the course of a week of doing two, three, 400 dials, you're going to run into the common ones you're going to run into, right? And it is a great exercise for you to do, even though I can tell you what they're going to be. Okay, I can tell you what they're going to be. Um, so, like in our business, it's we already took care of that. We're not interested. I don't have time. Those are the three. Those are the three main ones. Uh, <laughs> those are the three main ones. There, what is it? Yeah, and you know we're not interested. We took care of it already. I mean they're all kind of the same one. They say it different ways. Oh, we I have insurance at work. You know all these other things, and you know I'm, this is not designed to be an objection handling call. Like what exactly to say? Okay, that's going to be that's left to another script that we have. Uh, maybe I could I could talk about that. But here's my point. You have to write them down. In fact, let me um, let me go over that. And, and here's the funny thing about that, is that we do have scripts to handle objections, but here's what you do as an agent. You kind of wing, you wing it. Most agents wing, wing this business because they think, oh, how hard can it be to answer objections? You know, you kind of use your own sales savvy that you had in the past. You don't think you're, you're you think you're too good to um, learn objection handling on our script and you think you're too good and then when you encounter it you're going holy crap I don't know how to answer that one like a lot of you will do that you're not going to look at the script you're not going to look at a lot of things that we put up there and you know what I don't mean that as an indictment I just know how you are I know how y'all are and I can be mad about it or I can just say you know what that's just how it is like I know how my kids are you know they don't listen to me until something relevant that they do, and my words will echo in their head. So I'll, I'll, when I tell my kids stuff and teach them stuff, I just plant the seed because I know they don't just they don't listen, right? Well, Alex, that's a cynical attitude. No, no, it's not cynical. It's real. It's real. It's real. Just like you, like because I'm teaching you, you're only going to capture about ten percent to fifteen percent of what I say, even though you know I've been doing this twenty two years. But someone else on the call who's just been with us six months will say something and then you're going to hear it. It's going to ring loud and clear to you because it's a different person saying it. Okay. Does that bother my ego? No, it doesn't. It just makes you broke longer and just means you got to, which is why you need to attend the Zoom, you know, Andy's um, TWC and the activity call, all the outside calls outside of me. That's why you need to attend those more because you're not you're not going to listen to me. You're only going to really listen only about 10% to 15% of what I say. I know that's true. So all the more reason. Well, Alex, I just, you know, I'm in it because of you. It's like, come on, man. I'm just a guy who got in this thing before you, and you're only going to listen to so much what I'm going to say, no matter how, 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 just that's the way it is. All right. So, I'm going to try to plant this seed that you got to figure it out yourself. Okay. Like I did again, there's that firstborn in me. Like I'll figure everything out myself before I'll talk to someone. I'll make all the mistakes first and then I'll learn from my mistakes, but I'm willing to go after it like a crazy man. So I can get all the learning done quicker than later, right? Sooner than later. That's the way, that's the way I am. Okay. Um, assuming that you're not like me, like I don't know how many firstborn are out there, 
there's only a handful of us. <laughs> all right. So this is the way to do it is you got to write down all your objections. Okay. One, two, three, four, your main ones. You know, you're probably going to, majority of them will be your top three. Okay. Probably the ones I mentioned, but I'm not going to presume that. Okay. Then what you got to do is once you find what these out, then you got to come up with a plan. What is your plan to answer these objections? What is your plan to answer this one, this one, and this one? What are you going to say? Look, answering objections, especially some of the harder ones, I'm not going to mention the ones, but you know that what they are. If you turn around one out of 10, you're doing good. Okay. But you got to come back with something because just like no one picks up a phone that never rings, no one answers an objection that they never get because you don't call dial the phone to make a phone ring. You see what I'm saying? So you know you're going to get these. What's your game plan to answer them? Do you have, are you practicing a comeback? And if you have a comeback, then use it every time. And when they say the objection, immediately respond with the answer. You know, typically it's, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's exactly the reason why I'm calling, okay? I mean, there is a formula to answering objections. It's, I'm not gonna teach it here, but it's a pattern interrupt, make a statement, and then you ask a question. That's all it is, man. Pattern interrupt, statement, ask a question. And this is designed to keep the conversation going with the client. The longer you can keep on the phone, the higher your percentage chance goes up that you're going to book the appointment or that you're going to do a sale. That's all it is. I mean, it's, it's really simple. Okay, it, now let me ask you this. Is there any emotion involved here? Where did I say that, you're, that you have to be scared? Where did I say that you have to be fearful. Where did I say that you, have, you know what I'm saying? Now look, I got straight A's in school, except for one B in PE, because I said a lot of swear words. Check this out, I was a two year varsity basketball player and it was freaking basketball PE class. where I just tore everybody up. Like my team always won and we used to kill people I love killing pedestrians, civilians. I would run up the score, and then when I would miss a shot, I would just start swearing. So my dad gum PE teacher gave me a B, and I was a straight A student. You know, I lost valedictorian because of that one B. You know, some Chinese girl beat me just by a little bit. She got straight A's, I got one B. And you know what, that still causes me Great consternation. Her name's Kim Young, this Chinese girl, man. Not that being Chinese is anything. It's just I totally identify her as the Chinese girl, Chinese girl that beat me. The reason why she beat me is because I beat myself because I would cuss up a storm in basketball. Anyway, I don't know why I said that. But pattern interrupt statement, ask a question. That's all it is. There's no emotion in that formula, no emotion. And if you just do it in a relaxed, laid back way, you're gonna turn around the people that you're gonna turn around. See, the beauty, beautiful thing about being on the phone is you're just looking for the nice people that wanna talk back at you. You're just looking for people that are gonna answer your question. Pattern interrupt statement, ask a question. They answer it. Right, you keep them going. That's all, that's all objection handling is. So what is your pattern interrupt statement question for number one, number two, number three? And if you have four and five that you think are you know, significant, learn all five. Learn it, do it, learn it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And there should be no hesitation in your voice when you get it, because if there's a gap between the objection and your pattern interrupt, that is chum to a shark, right? That is blood in the water. When a 
when a client senses that you're brand new and you don't know what you're doing, they're gonna jump all over your butt. You know what I'm saying? They don't care. People are bold and have courage when they don't see you face to face. They say anything on the phone. People lack so much respect on the phone. You already know that. So when you get it, you shouldn't be surprised, right? I'm not telling you anything that you should be surprised about. I'm telling you what's gonna happen. See, isn't it cool knowing that you're gonna know in advance what's gonna happen? So now that you know what's in advance what's gonna happen, what is your game plan to handle it? Because all too often salespeople react emotionally to something that they don't understand, okay? I know why I was talking about being salutatorian, number two. The first of the losers is what I was. She had this grade point average. I had the second highest in the school for my class, and I was the first loser, okay? So being the first loser, <laughs> I studied my butt off. I always enjoyed being the curve buster. I enjoyed when people didn't do the work, and because I busted the curve, their C ended up being Ds. And those B people, if they had a normal class curve, their Bs would be Cs. And you know what? I totally enjoyed that. I got more satisfaction beyond me getting an A to watch everyone squirm because I was the curb buster and I enjoyed that reputation. I, it was demented, I know, and kind of a little bit psychopathic in that way, but I enjoyed busting the curve. And, and the reason why is because those Nimnots didn't work as hard as me. They didn't work as hard as me. And I only had like a 115 IQ. You know, I had like a measly one, you know, that's not even Mensa, okay? And these people didn't work. And so I enjoyed that. But here's my point. I was prepared for every test. Have you ever been prepared? Like you study so hard for a test, like I got this. I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna kill it. I work my butt off to get that feeling. So I wouldn't get freaked out during the test when I encounter a question, I, I knew what they're gonna ask. And I was ready to answer every single one of those questions. Well, there was a, a problem formula that I was trying to work out. I walked in confident. I was gonna kick everybody's butt in this room. I was gonna bust curves. I was gonna make B students, C students. That was my motivation. I know I'm an a, I was an a-hole back then but I was really a, an academic a-hole that, um, but you know, whatever. That was my motivation. I was prepared. I was unemotional. It was like, I got this. Why would you, in a business like this, if you're trying to get free from your stupid job to make the tremendous amount of income that's available here by you going out there and just doing the work and going out there, there's money waiting for you out there. All you're doing is just uncovering the rocks, finding out what's under the rock, what's under the rock, or you know, use the carnival, the carnival analogy where the duck's on a pond, you're just turning over ducks, finding winner. Is this a winner? Is this a winner? Is this a winner? Gang, that's all this is. It's just picking up ducks, right? You did what people were afraid to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, why would you do anything less in our business? Why would you ever wing it when you would you when you didn't have to? And this is where my compassion for you, I have to find it. When you come back at me and tell me all this stuff, and in my mind I'm going, huh. Nimnod didn't practice the electronic application and that's why he's having or she's having trouble getting into it. Alex, I can't get into the e-app. And you're with a client? Yes, I'm with a client right now. So I have to conjure up through the Holy Spirit's guidance all the compassion I can in my heart to not yell at you, why didn't you get into it before your appointment, right? Everything in me will try to be kind. It's like, oh, now some of you who know me, you know I will say something that's a very, you won't even catch it sometimes until after we're done. And you're gonna, because I'll say something like, oh, wow. Um, 
how long have you known you had this appointment? Well, you know, I, I booked it yesterday. Oh, okay. That's my way of slapping you upside the head. <laughs> I'd certainly like to do it in a different way, but I, I hold back. <laughs> I don't want to make you mad. I really do kind of want you to look at yourself and, you know, decide, golly, I, sh I should have practiced this before. <laughs> How many times have I said that? Which is, again, why I go back to you only listen to 10% of what I say. You prove it to me every time. I get a call <laughs> like that. Anyway, be prepared. Be prepared. So phone call objection handling is just a matter of being prepared so that you're unemotional when it happens because you know it's going to happen. You already know advance what you're going to get. You already know what the top objections are. You already know. So why wouldn't you practice those so you're ready to get them? No, it just seems somewhat obvious to me, but maybe it isn't to you. So I'm trying to make it obvious to you. Am I making sense to anybody out there? Or did people quit this call because I was being too uh, real? Not being prepared when you are actually in an appointment is a big red, red flag, yeah. Crystal clear, yes, makes sense, total sense, okay, cool. Okay, so I'm gonna shift this whole notion of being prepared in advance to something that you know that's going to happen. Isn't it interesting that when you are prepared for what you know is gonna happen, you know, like the end of the world, like when you're gonna die, are we in the business of being prepared when, the, when a tragedy happens? We are totally in this business, gang. That's why we sell insurance to help people prepare in advance for the tragedy that's going to befall them when they die and the tragedy that their families will experience. And our job is to soften the financial impact for their families. We'll never soften the emotional impact, right? So that we're in the business of risk mitigation. <laughs> that's sort of the nerdy way to say it, but we're preparing people in advance. Those of us in ministry, we're preparing people in advance for when the Lord calls them home and he decides whether you're going the up escalator or the down escalator. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Heaven or hell. Are you prepared for stuff that you know will happen in your future? Are you prepared for retirement? <laughs> Okay, here's the other thing. Are you prepared for what you're going to encounter in this business? Like, I, I don't know if you know what's going to happen in the business, but with all businesses, with all things new, you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have things happen to you that are not fun. We know that. It's like getting married. Now, we all are, we get married thinking, this whole Pollyanna marriage thing, right? The romance of it. You're all in, in enamored with the romance of being married, but you're not prepared for the fact that she squeezes the toothpaste in the middle. And I like to squeeze the toothpaste at the bottom, right? You're not enamored with the fact that she likes to sleep in till like one in the afternoon. And I like to get up at like 7.30 is sleeping in for me, okay? You, I'm getting too personal here. <laughs> I'm talking theoretically, so don't, don't text Ginny. Hey, Alex said you squeeze toothpaste from the middle. Actually, she doesn't. She has, she's very meticulous at squeezing from the bottom. I'm the one that's kind of squeezes it like this. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm saying? You already, so you should know. You should know that you're going to have arguments. You, you should know that you're going to be disagreeing about something. So have you worked out how you're going to, um, come to some decision. The problem with people getting married is they don't know how to handle those issues that they know is gonna come up. Because they don't think they're, they don't think they're gonna, it's ever gonna come up. Because when they're courting and dating, they always avoided conflict because, oh, I love you. 
you're so beautiful. Like I watched my son and his girlfriend. He's a freshman in college. He's a freshman in college. And I just, it's not that I'm cynical, but I'm just like, I look at my wife and go, God, were we like that? They're all like holding hands and they're just hugging each other all the time. They can't be apart from each other. They gotta be touching each other. I looked at her and go, were we like that? And she goes, yeah, we were kind of like that. Really, I don't remember being all like googly eyes, you know. And she goes, yeah, you were like that. Anyway, so my point is here in our business, we know that you're going to run into stuff, tough stuff. You're going to run into, like I'll list, I'll, this is what, I will list these. You're, you're going to run into chargebacks. Okay, that, that big commission from that person that you know is going to keep their policy forever, you're going to get like a $500 chargeback. Okay, number two. <laughs> you're going to have a bad sales week. Number three, your spouse is going to question your sanity of doing this business. <laughs> question sanity. You know, your family, they're going to question your sanity too. Right? What's another thing? Um, the commissions aren't where you thought they would be. You thought they were, you were going to make more money. With all this work you're doing, you thought it was going to be easier when it's in fact harder than you thought it was. You thought it was going to be easier. Um, not enough money for leads. Number eight, fear of the phone, of success, of failure. You're going to run into the thought that maybe God is telling me I shouldn't be doing this, which is really hilarious. I get that. I just crack up. Maybe God's telling me I shouldn't be doing this. Okay, so which time was God lying to you? That when you felt led that this was an answer to your prayer? Or, you know what I'm saying? Just because it got hard, maybe God's telling me I shouldn't be doing it. When in fact, Satan knows what great things you're going to be able to do if you overcome your fear, and he's afraid of you. See, Satan throws darts at people that are a threat to him. It's just how it is, man. It's how it is. So my question for you, and I can put a bunch of other things in here. What is your reaction going to be when you get your first charge back? Are you going to like say, oh my God, this business doesn't work? Are you going to call me and say, how do I handle this? How can I get better at placing a persistency so I don't experience th this as much as, as I will? Because we're all going to have chargebacks. Really, we've got 90%, our top people are doing 90% placing a persistency, right? So if they can do it, you can too. So you have to decide when you start getting chargebacks, how am I going to react? Well, I'm going to react by understanding that maybe I need to be better at placement of persistency, or maybe this is just part of the numbers. I'm going to call Alex. I'm going to talk through this. What could I have done better in the sale to keep that policy on the books? What could I have done better? That's a very unemotional, logical reaction to that circumstance. And when you can, when you have made the decision that you're going to react that way to that circumstance, man, you are so further ahead because you know what's going to happen. How are you going to handle a bad sales week where you worked your butt off but didn't turn anything in? How are you going to react? Are you going to think this is a bad trend? Are you going to think this is just a run? Are you going to call me and say, hey, I need some coaching. This is what happened. 
I need to put it in context. What could I have done better? Very unemotional reaction, a very winning reaction to an adverse situation that could happen. It's funny when someone has an awesome sales week, they're not calling me saying, huh, Alex, I had a really great sales week. I'm a little concerned. <laughs> Actually, you should be concerned because you should call me and say, you know, I had a really good sales week. Um, how can I continue to sustain that? Well, let's go through each sale and let's talk about it. How, why did it go well? I'm going to ask you, why did you think it go, went well? Chances are you're going to say, well, I did 500 dials and I booked, you know, 30 appointments. So I don't care how many numbers, those kind of numbers should produce something. Exactly. Right. When your spouse says, Alex, I don't think this thing's working. How are you going to react? You're going to go, oh my God, she's not going to let me do it. <laughs> and I would say to you men out there, zip your, zip up your pants in the front and not the side. Buck up, bow up, and do your job as a leader of your family. That's what I would say. I'll say it nicer if you say, Alex, my spouse is wondering if I should be doing this. And I'll say, hey, that happens all the time. <laughs> no big deal, man. You could do this. You just got to prove to her, man. This is a great opportunity to prove to her that you are a winner and that you can do this. You know what I'm saying? Because once she sees money going into your account, your evenings will be much better. Let me tell you. <laughs> she's going to be much more open to suggestion because she's not right now. <laughs> know what I'm saying? Your family, your broke family members, are you still doing that in Shawwin's thing? Man, I know people that just couldn't make that work. Why would you think you would do it? So what is your reaction to that? My reaction would be, stop hanging around your family, dude. You don't need to hear that crap. Why, when what universe should you be going to a dinner with your family that gets on you for what they do, what you're doing to make money for your family, right? Are you, do you get on them? Why are you still an accountant for that company? I hear accountants have the worst work in the world. You don't do that to them. Why let them do it to you? What is your reaction in advance? Your commissions aren't where they need to be. Oh my, oh my gosh, Alex, it's not working. It's not working. I, I expected to make you know, 2,000 a week, but I'm only making 1,000 a week. Okay. Maybe it's not working for me. Maybe the business sucks. Maybe I suck. Okay, that's your emotional reaction. But here's a better reaction that I would suggest, Alex. I'm not where I want to be. What do I need to change? What do I need to do? What do I need to change about what I'm doing? Perfect reaction, unemotional, logical, and you're not freaking out. Alex, I thought the business would be easier. Yeah, <laughs> so did I. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, if you've got a game plan to handle all these eventualities and the other things that you know, especially the God, God's telling me to get out of the business. You know, fear. How are you going to handle the emotion of fear? There is a logical and unemotional reaction to all these. Have you made a decision on how you're going to react to that? Right? Okay. So just like there's an answer to objections in phone calls, and dialing, there's an answer to all these eventualities that will happen to you in the business. Have you made a decision on how you're going to react to that? Because if you have, then you got a sh shot to make it. I'm telling you what, you got a shot to make it. Okay, so let's get real. Let's kind of get real here and let's talk unemotionally and logically about the whole concept of lead investment, okay? I mean, the numbers are just so compelling, but I don't know that you work it out in your, in your brain 
on how lead investment leads to sales. <laughs> it seems logical, but see, so this is that formula, right? You need a schedule that you're committed to, right? Then you need leads. And then you need to dial those leads. Okay. This will give you a result. Okay. The more time you have your scheduled, the more leads that you invest in, the more dials you make will be an increase in result. Less time in your schedule, less leads, and less dials will have a negative result. It's very simple, right? Very simple. I talk about this all the time. So let, what does this translate to money on this part right here? Well, I'm going to be crazy. But let's say you buy the $8 mail pro leads. These are the internet leads. Okay. And let's say you, $8. So let's say you invest, invest in 100. 100 $8 leads. So eight times 100 is 800. It's crazy. Okay, I'm not saying if this is every week or every month. I'm just saying this is a period of time that you invest 800 bucks. You put on a credit, you got $800 left on your credit card, and you buy 100 of the $8 mail pro leads. Okay. So out of 100 leads, let's say you close 8%. Right? Right? 8%, you ought to be really closing 20%, but let's just drop it down to 8%. So 8% of 100 is what, eight? So you close eight sales, okay? The average sale, let's just say it's 800 bucks, annual premium, right? Eight times eight, $6,400 in annual premium, okay? Let's multiply it by the, the product factors you know, because whole life and in and simplified issue term, and if you mix all those different commission rates together, you know, let's say you're at um, are all the different payout rates. Um, I call this like the 85% arc factor. So the issue paid, um, the actual amount that you're going to get paid on. Is fifty four forty. Okay, after you take the you know the different commission rates, and let's say you multiply that by eighty five percent. The let's say you're at the eighty five percent commission rate. What? Why do I say that? Do you know in our in our hierarchy? That if you do 30 issue paid sales, even if you start at 55, which, you know, I you know, we start typically brand, 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 brand new people, you can get to 85 by doing 30 issue paid sales. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, man. That's our promotion guideline to 85. It's a fast track to 85. 30. Once you hit 30, it could take you a month, it could take you two months, it could take you two years, but 30 issue paid sales, bam, you get to 85. So I just baseline everything at 85. So you're going to get paid on 46.24. Uh, you're going to get 85% of that times 75% advance. Thirty-four sixty-eight. Okay, so you invested 800 to make 3468. What is that? Four times, a little over four times return. So you net minus 800. You netted 2668. So if you were doing 800 a month, 
2868 times 12 months, if you just stayed, is 32,000 a year part time. That's like doing two sales issued every week. Now, if you did 800 in a week, you'd be making 2668 times four. You're making 10 grand a week. Um, a month, I mean. Is are these numbers? Are these numbers like? <laughs> right, but Alice, I don't have eight hundred bucks. What do you have? Can you put it on a credit card? Can you sell a couple family and friends? Alex, that's my warm market. Yeah, people you care about should maybe get insurance. Sell two or three of your friends. You're going to have more than enough, more than enough out of your commissions, right? If you sell three friends, what, three times 800, 2,400. Now you do the math, right? You're going to have enough to invest in leads. Well, should I do it all up front? Should I spread it out? Do it all up front, man. You got, you got 100 leads and you're willing to pound the phone? I mean, God, and this is only at 8%, closing only 8%. It ought to be 20. If these leads are so terrible that you only can convert 8%, like on worse protection, if you're going into the home, you should be converting three. Three out of 10 leads, you know, which equates to about four applications, you know, four to five applications, because you're going to find a few that you can do two apps in the home. This makes sense. Uh, yeah. Hello? Is there a question? Okay. So, Let's see. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how I can make this any easier for you. And if you want to be on a regular, you know why, that's why the Levintovich team does 40 appointments a week is because they've got enough leads to do 40 a week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so anyway. Decide in advance how you're going to react to all those things I mentioned, how you're going to react to phone objections, how you're going to re react to stuff in our business. And then we can come up with unemotional, cogent, logical, unemotional solutions for you to overcome your perceived um, inability to move forward in the business. Okay, now, now I know a lot of you are going, God, 800, 800. I'm, you got that 800 in your mind now. Now you're thinking that's a big obstacle. I would be fired up. It's like, man, I'm going to get that money. I'm going to get that money, and I'm going to put that together. Like if someone came to you and they they told you, man, I've got this hot thing that's going to turn around. You got 800 bucks. I promise you, you're going to make five times your money within a week. I've got this guy who's got this thing going down right now. It's Bitcoin and blah, blah, blah. I promise you, guaranteed, for sure, five times can you come up with 800 bucks? I will, I will guarantee it. I don't know how they guarantee that. What would you do? You would do everything you could to get 800 bucks. Or if someone kidnapped your child and said, the ransom is $800. What would you do to put together $800? You know what? If you treated this business like... A kidnapper took your family, because they kind of are, really, when you think about it, because you're not providing for your family like you ought to be. And it's like having someone kidnap your family and saying, I'm sorry, you're not providing for them. You're, you are less than infidel because you are not providing for your family the way the Lord expects you to. 
And so we're going to hold them hostage until you come up with 800 bucks to start stepping up and, and providing for your family. Because right now, you are not. You are a big, fat... I am not being nice, am I? <laughs> I'm not being nice. Well, you know what? Sometimes it takes not being nice to get you to wake your butt up to do what you need to be doing. Your family's being held hostage financially because you're not doing what you need to do. Step up, Bo. Come up with the money. It's not 800, maybe it's 400, maybe it's 200, maybe it's whatever. But step up, man. If you're willing to put the schedule together and willing to dial, then the only thing missing are the leads. Okay. You know what? If you invest some, I might invest some too. If I see you on stuff, I see you coaching with me, I see you making a real effort. When you tell me you're going to dial on Saturday, and you actually dial on Saturday, you have no idea how many people tell me, yeah, I'm gonna dial Saturday, I promise, man, I'm gonna kill it. And I don't check in on them. We have a conversation later, and I know because they turn in their activity report, they didn't do one freaking dial on Saturday. Well, I guess they don't care about their family because they're keeping their family held hostage. And obviously they don't love them enough to be able to be good for their word, number one. Number two, do something, do something relevant that would make an impact for their family's financial situation because they wanted to do more things with their kids and they just felt like a bad father because they had to do stuff with their, if they don't do stuff with their children, when the reality is in fact, you are a terrible father because you're not providing for your family. And it keeps doing, you keep doing that every day that you don't do this business. You're a terrible father, terrible provider because you just get lulled into that Satan based, I'm a bad father because I'm not spending time with my kids. Now you're a bad father because you're not providing for your children. Okay, anyway, I love you, man. I only say that out of love. I want you to wake up and smell the coffee and get your butt in gear. Let's do this thing because this is a money machine. There are people waiting for you to cover them where you can, it's just a money grab, money grab. I'm going to grab money here. I'm going to grab money here to provide for my family. You can do this thing, man. I know you can do this thing. If you just step up, decide in advance how you're going to react to all those adverse situations and then implement the game plan of all those unemotional reactions. And let's get this thing going, man. God bless y'all. Hope this made sense. <laughs> Take care.